Okay, good good day, people. I'm here with Miss Mary Hooks out of Atlanta. I saw her on Democracy Now! and I reached out to her so we could talk to her about a few things. Uh, I uh, gathered some interview questions and and we're about to get started. So, how are you today, Miss Mary Hooks? Oh, I'm well, well, strong, black, fortified, feel good. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Glad to hear that. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the first question. What is the state of Africans in the U.S. and abroad? And when I say Africans, I'm meaning people of African descent. Yes, yes. And I appreciate you referring to us as Africans. Cause I feel like that is one of the states of uh, telling of the state of black people, because many of us have forgot that we are, in fact, Africans and descendants of Africans. And then how, what that then means for our relationship and positionality inside of this, you know, colonized state. Um, you know, we see the numbers. We see um, the ways in which black people are, are impacted by all manner of police and state violence, whether that be uh, this COVID crisis that we're in, whether it be police murders, uh, mass incarceration, health disparities. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, this is not, as um, in the words of Asada Shakur, uh, black people are not uh, citizens of this country. We're victims of it. And it plays out every day on the news and in our neighborhoods, you know. And so we're, um, we're in a horrific state. And I think what that also then says when we take a broader a look across the diaspora, that many of the uh, ways in which this U.S. empire has inflicted so much suffering for folk in the U.S., they continue to do that. Um, all across our people's uh, lives across this, this world um, through their imperial projects, through the way in which they uh, fund wars um, and the way they promote and put up public um, dictators and, and presidents that don't mean our people no good to can continue to advance the neoliberal agenda, which we know um, is not, it never benefits um, those who are considered um, at the, the margins of society. And so, yeah, we're we're in a we're in a in a state. However, um, I believe that we are also in a in a beautiful posture of resistance uh, all across the globe. I had the lesson of being on the call uh, last week with several women across the diaspora, and they were talking about the organizing efforts that uh, Black women, queer and trans people, just Black people broadly, are doing um, to combat um, all forms of, of oppression and violence. So, and as much as things is hard, um, I must say that black people are also in, in resistance, which is always a good sign that we are no ways tired. Even though we might be tired, we're no ways tired. Excellent, excellent. Okay. How does the U.S. political system affect Africans in this country? Hmm. Well, I think that, you know, history would tell us that the U.S. political system was developed on our on our suffering it was developed um in the context of um the slaughter torture of indigenous folk here folks who are indigenous to this land and black folk um who were stolen and made it through the middle passage and the from the policy uh from policies to its economic system it's all been set up to ensure that um white supremacy and white supremacists and those who um, either passively or directly uh, support it continue to maintain uh, power and control um, and containment and confinement. And um, I think over the years we've seen the way in which this country has refused to um, ever own up to that in a real way and to take responsibility and accountability, and it continues to show up in the uh, policies that even what one would call, quote-unquote, progressive policies. You see that it's usually crumbs that they're offering our people and not actual transformative change uh, because, you know, folks in power don't want to give it up. And so we continue to see, uh, as we call here for the defunding of police, that instead that you see policymakers continue to put forward policy legislation that they know they know we have and can, we have borne witness that it does not work, and it's not a policy change that we need. We need to literally shift money and begin divesting and taking money away from the institutions that harm us, and actually 
um, invested in the institutions and community-based solutions um, that we know are going to fix the ills of our of our communities. And because we know that that is not their ultimate goal, we continue to see policy be used as a way to um, to uh, to placate and to pretend as if uh, changes on the horizon. But we know, um, and and again, history will tell us, and and what we see now will tell us that anything that they're proposing that is not um, that did not come from the people, that is not a solution that's rooted in the people, is not going to work. And again, I don't and I don't believe that they actually want it to work um, because we know that many of these systems, you know, if we even look at mass incarceration, we know that um, that it's so it's so much tied to the bag and to the dollar that it isn't it doesn't serve their interest um, to make changes because the police, for example, are the are the dragnet that pulls people into um, the jails and the prisons. Where, whereby our labor can be exploited. And so there's a, a huge financial is, interest uh, because that's the way capitalism works in order for our people, in order for sy- systems to remain the way they are. They're inherently, inherently rotten. Hmm. Yes, I agree. Okay. Mm-hmm. What are the effects of George For- Floyd's killing as it relates to African liberation? What are the facts? What are the effects of, of George Floyd's oh, killings? Facts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, one of the elders told me one time, they said, Mary, you know, most most people that come into movement oftentimes can associate the death of another black person to um, the moment when they decided that I must make it my life's work to um, to advance black liberation struggle. And so... It comes uh, at an unfortunate cost for for our people and for those who die. That oftentimes that is the the fire that ignites people to come out, to move, to organize, to join movement, to join organizations. You know, and for some it's you know it moves folks to come out and protest. You know, uh, for a few days or a month or however time period. But I think ultimately what it also continues to remind Black people again is our relationship to this country. And it also reminds us that, you know, and, and, and begs questions of us of like, what is it that we want and what is it and whom do we think have the means to provide it? Does the state, state with the capital S state, the state as we know it, uh, what is their responsibility to, to us as, as it relates to public safety? And so in this, uh, you know, discourse that we're in now when we're talking about defunding the police, uh, often, you know, I'm talking to a community and folks in my community, I'm like, we're talking about defunding the police, but the question then becomes, black people, what is it that we want to be for and with each other? Because ultimately what we're saying is that you must invest in the people, and yes, that does include, um, you know, building up new institutions, which means that, of course, there is, like, much work in terms of how you develop a, a, a quote-unquote a workforce of people, if you will, that can take on roles inside of these new institutions. But it's also about the, the way in which we relate and be in right relationship to one another. Like, I feel like one of the um, core tensions that we're grappling with right now as we're seeing um, gender-based violence play out, particularly on the lives of black women, black trans women, and queer people, that is happening uh, intercommunally. And, um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of men who black men in particular who have, um, you know, who who have drank the Kool-Aid of patriarchy. And unfortunately, they don't want to let go of that power and this and this um, and this desire to dominate. And I think that we have to have um, some level of reckoning inside of our communities as a part of this broader transformation that we're calling for. And so I think that the. Uh, you know, the murder of George Floyd, I think it has opened up so much, uh, so, so, so much, you know, where it is about, you know, the way in which the police responded. And then it also is about hearing and seeing what the desires of community is and what it is we're demanding from the state. But then I would also, you know, challenge us to also think about what does it mean for us to, um, for us to call, be able to call upon each other. Because if we're saying, look, when we call the police and this is what they do to us, or when they profile us and this is what they do to us, like, we can no longer call them. Many of us been knew that. Our grandma and them told us that, like, you know? And so I think that 
we have to also be willing to be sanctuary to one another. And so those are some of the things that is being unearthed, you know, in this and um, 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 at the expense of Mr. Floyd. Yes, uh, that was an excellent response. What I could see is that it's uh, kind of revealing that we need to to get our act together so we can call on each other versus calling them because we know that they don't have our best interest. So, yeah, that was an excellent response. All right. Um, what is your vision for African liberation worldwide? so much there's so much but i think when i think about african liberation worldwide i think the root of it is around uh self-determination and black folk being able to collectively self-determine um the way in which we govern ourselves the way in which we be in relationship the way in which we um you know engage in um in economics that doesn't that that is exploit one another um, and nor does it have us relying on the World Bank and other institutions that mean us no good and that we are, um, you know, in right relationship across the diaspora and we've been able to figure out how we, um, uh, organize and move in formation together whereby we can engage in global trade that again is not exploitative. And that, you know, I think that too, part of it is also calling the question around patriarchy across the globe because we know the same, uh, dynamics that are happening here as it relates to gender based violence is also happening across the water. And so, you know, my, my vision is to make sure that all of us have safety and dignity, that all of us aren't weighed down by the pressures of patriarchy nor the, the greed of capitalism and that we um, are able to thrive um, as our full selves, as our full selves. And I think part of that is uh, is certainly a land-based struggle, right? And that's beautiful and to have watched, um, you know, these last few years as, you know, comrades that I know in South Africa and, you know, have built a level of work where they're like, no, we're actually going to take these land from these white people who stole this from our people and give it back to the people in the hands that they belong in. But then it ultimately it isn't about ownership of the land. It's about being in right relationship to the land. And I think that part of our liberation as the first people um, in this on this earth is to be uh, in right relationship with Mother Earth. And so so the, um, the liberation of black people has to include um, uh, uh, climate justice. It has to include um, making sure that Mother Earth gets restored. I think when I think about some of the the ways in which COVID shut the world down and reports were saying that the seas are, are, are clearer, the skies are bluer, the fish that ain't, folk ain't seen in a while, they don't came back to surface. And so I think it's also us being able to, um, as uh, Sojourner True said, turn the world right side up again. And I think that part of our liberation is going to have to include that again with um with uh, economic system that isn't relying on you know the few to benefit off of the suffering of the many which we know is capitalism and um and and i think that you know moving towards socialism and climate two ray talks oftentimes uh you know uh talked about scientific socialism and i think that we have so much so much that history can teach us um you know with the work like um Thomas Sankra was doing um, with the um, is that the Bernie Bercani Fasco people. I believe I'll be pronouncing myself wrong sometimes, but there are some really great examples of of the ways in which we can take the best of things that our folks have tried across the diaspora and use them as models and with nuance um, to be able to embed in our our communities all across the globe. And I think we'll know we'll get there when we are able to have you know global black family reunions, <laughs> you know, and our folks can show up in our full selves. And not that, and again, and I don't, I don't want to, um, to, uh, to, to make as if black people are these mythical beings. No, we're very much, uh, humans who cause harm and do all the things. And I, be, I thoroughly believe that, 
we can create different models of the way in which we handle the struggles inside of our that we have inside of our humanity. And I think we do this in a uh, black liber- in, a, in an agenda that would move toward this uh, African liberation. It's through a black queer feminist lens. There is an ideology that's deeply attached to much of the work that we're seeing both here in the states and globally. When I talk to other comrades, folks are well studied around that and have looked at the works of the Cumbie River Collective and uh, Barbara Smith and Kimberly Crenshaw and so, so, so many people who have, you know, given us an insight that said if we begin to see our lives as interconnected and also understand that systems of oppression are connected, uh, when we begin to craft our freedom dreams, it has to inherently be anti-capitalist. It has to be anti-patriarchal. It has to be um, uh uh, anti, anti prisons, right? It has to have an abolitionist, um, lens to it because we know if those who have been impacted, you know, by all these intersections of race, class, gender, ability, et cetera, um, begin to lay out a vision, all of us will be free. You know what I mean? All of us will get free. And what? so I feel like, uh, it's possible if we continue to politicize our folk around a black queer feminist lens, we'll get there. It may take a few generations, but we'll get there. Okay, now, I, I, um, I have, uh, uh, the, I interviewed my, um, my mentor, and I also interviewed a, a buddy of mine, both related to the Black Studies Program at Long Beach State. And, in what you were saying, I wanted to ask you something that's that's uh, that I that I kind of got from my my buddy, and I wanted to see what you how you feel about this. He said that uh, black the black people or the African people in the United States should should form a government mm-hmm. would actually. Uh, elected officials that's going to represent us here in the United States and I wanted to see if you what do you think about that idea because that's uh, I don't know if that was uh, out there before but it, it seems kind of interesting something that maybe we could look at but what, what do you think about that you know, I think uh, I think that is certainly a viable uh, option and certainly necessary. I'm, I forget the name of the. Uh, there was some work historically that came out of the New African Independence Movement, and they developed a governing body. Um, and I cannot remember the names for sometimes too much being a file cabinet. And so those those that um, that has been experimented with, I think, uh, at the scale in which um, it played out. I think is, is, you know, is where there, there have been gaps or whatnot. But I think that, you know, ultimately, because it does determine, like, uh, we need to be able to govern ourselves. We need to be able to govern ourselves. And I think that some people might look at places like in Atlanta, for instance, and like, we have black landed officials. We're already doing it. No, 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 no. Because we're doing it through uh, a, a white supremacist structure. Thank you. System. Thank you. You know what I mean? Like, yes. that ain't ours. And our folks get employed to do their bidding and their work. Many of them have not, have gone into those institutions. And as I understand it, post-civil rights movement, when all these black electeds were, you know, taking office and, and all these urban cities like Atlanta, Detroit, D.C., et cetera, et cetera, that, and then you had the establishment of the Congressional Black Caucus was supposed to be the conscious of Congress, you know, and none of those things panned out. Black people are, no, are, are not in a better position because they have taken roles inside an institution. So I think we need a, um, a honest assessment and critique of that strategy um, and to be able to say that black people, we do actually have the means to govern ourselves, and there, and there are ways in which people do that. And I think that it's being experimented in different ways. Um, you know, when you when I look at uh, participatory budgeting processes that folks are pushing for and engaged in, like in Jackson, Mississippi, or the people's uh, movement assemblies that they do in order to identify what are the key, uh, key priorities in terms of community building and community, uh, you know, community relations, et cetera, you know, people are moving uh, these different processes whereby we can engage in democratic and in, in, in democratic ways, you know. And so I think that, you know, much like um, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, and, and again, I, 
you know, them coming out of the new African independence movement, a lot of the vision is a six state nation. Um, and the, and black folk here in the continent, uh, on the, in the U.S. being able to have six, take six, uh, states and say, these are ours. And we're going to govern them and, uh, by ourselves, have our own system, et cetera, et cetera. And some people look at that and like, uh, you know, and there's some critiques around, well, why these states? Can we grow there? What's the infrastructure? You know what I mean? So it's all of these different ways in which people have analyzed it and all the things. But I think the heart of it is black people, do we have the means, uh, and, and will to govern ourselves? And I think that, I think it's possible. I think it's necessary. Well, and I think, you know, I feel like it's necessary. Well, well, what you say, the will, yes, that's what it takes, the will. Yeah. I know the ability is there. You know, we have many sharp people, you know, that that's, uh, you know, that's real sharp. It's just a matter of us uh, being with us and, and wanting yeah. to be with us instead of steady just i have a paper that i wrote it's called why do you chase the devil and it's basically just it's saying that in one sense it's saying that you what you're doing is wrong and you know it's wrong why are you doing it and then another sense is saying that you are are taking on the personality of your oppressor and you want wanting to be like your oppressor so it's we we have a lot of work to do, but I'm I'm glad I'm talking to you today because you are laying it out there. Okay, this this next question has uh, a lot to it and a lot to probably digest. So I'm gonna go as slow as possible. I'm a, it's uh it's some statements first and then it's a question. So uh, here here we go. The African family have many entities working against it especially the system of white supremacy racism. Francis Cress Welsing spoke about the white races' fear of genetic annihilation. Neely Fuller Jr. has a saying in his book, uh, The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, if you do not understand white supremacy racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Okay, these two scholars have a strong influence on my thinking, and I closely resemble Neely Fuller's thinking because he uses logic as his base. And I, I'm a math teacher, so you know that I'm numbers and logical in my scope. Okay, first question is, are you familiar with these two scholars and their work? I'm familiar with... Um with Ms. Francis, the last gentleman um, I'm not familiar with, but you should certainly send me some resources so I can get oh, so I can get familiar for sure. All you got to do is type in uh, producejustice.com, and and there you go. He has a he has a book out that I just uh, mentioned the title and and uh, he's I'm telling you he's this this guy. Uh, I've listened to Malcolm, Martin, Farrakhan, I mean so many people and as a matter of fact, uh he's uh Francis Chris Wilson's sort of like mentor. He's ninety years old. He has a weekly show. He's ninety years old. So he's he's been around for a while and uh he's uh one of the he's a guy that that don't he's for the work and not for personality. So, you know, he doesn't want people to look at him as a personality. He just wants them to take a look at his work and see if it could help them. I mean, you I think you would find it very interesting to see him. I mean, you know, to to see his his work and and his thought process, because I think he's awesome. I really do. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to check it out. I'm looking at the website now. Okay. I'm going to check it out. I think um, and what my assessment, too, is in which uh, some of the statements that you that you talked about, um, particularly with the African family, um, I oftentimes, you know, think about, our, you know, a lot of us, we have a really good assessment of white supremacy and racism, but oftentimes uh, our assessment around um, particularly gender often is where we get um, where we get strangled up, right? Because if we understand white supremacy and the pillars of it, 
right, which is um, slavery and, and, and capitalism. It's um, Orientalism and war, right? It's the, the, the way in which they move as imperialists across the globe and trying to smite black and brown people uh, all over the world. And then we also have the pillar of, um, uh, what's the other one? Um, Lord have mercy, I'm going to look it up while I'm running my mouth. But then there's also heteropatriarchy. And that's where I feel like we have to deepen our assessments because if we don't make a full, have a full analysis, our solutions will be incomplete in the words of Charlene Carruthers. And so I think that um, in as much as we know that uh, the black family, quote unquote, it depends on how we have to unpack what his family look like, because as African people, we're village people. We come out of a, a tradition of folk who believe it's a village that raises a child. It isn't this nuclear man, woman, two dog, two kids and a dog and a picket fence. That's some white folk stuff. And unfortunately, we have, um, because many of us have that, uh, that very heteronormative uh, patriarchal lens in which we see, um, uh, we see the world when we begin to talk. And so that's why we hear black folks saying often like, oh, well, if the black man will just come home, all will get right. And, and you even see the right wing um, uh, taking on uh, Obama. Now, I ain't just the right, um, the elite class, if you will, the, the petty bourgeoisie and the, the elite will say, you know, it's because black fathers aren't home. But that's in the pits of hell. If, if, you know, I don't think that's the truth. What I actually think is that, yes, there is the right role for all black people inside of the village. Always, always that our family structure shouldn't be based on, you know, this nuclear model that white folks have constructed, but we should also, our communities should always be rooted in love. Our village should be rooted in love, however that plays out. And this thing that black, if when black men come home, all will get right, I think is an undue pressure for black men, particularly when they live at the intersections of race um, and gender, where, yeah, you're a man, and so... Many black men think that they're, they should aspire to get and have what white men have, but then their race um, limits them to be able to do that. And so you tell the black men to come home with, so that even though the, the boundaries of white supremacy is not going to, you know, allow him to be self-determined in his labor, the, the money he make, et cetera, and it's beyond that. We know that, you know, um, our roles inside of the village, you know, have to be... Um, and they, 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 there is no static role that we, we all contribute to, to our livelihood in many ways. And that, um, if we continue to perpetuate patriarchy as a, as a ways of freedom, the same way there are black capitalists, so like if black people will just shop at black businesses and, you know what I mean, that's still rooted in, in a capitalist structure, then that's not freedom because somebody's going to be exploited. And so if we continue again for patriarchy to continue to be a pillar by which we see our liberation, we're going to continue to get solutions, uh, you know, false solutions. And, and that dynamic between men and women and those who uh, live outside of the gender binary and trans folk and queer people will never be able to get full liberation as black people. And so that's why when we talk about all black lives, we have to understand that if we need all of us, all of us. And, and again, that um, what I often have seen in, in different folks' writings is, a, um, is a, 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 a desire and need for a deeper assessment around gender and patriarchy. Well, you know, let me say a few things about that. Well, um, nothing that our oppressor does, I want to be like. <laughs> and And I know that there's... There's much talk around gender and, and, you know, gender and patriarchy and all of this and that. I, I, I'm into revolutionary thinking. And revolutionary thinking does not require being like the oppressor. So when it, when it comes to, to, uh, male and female relationships, um, I had my last question for you. And let me let me just go to that last question and then we could, you know, speak a little bit further. Um, this this is a perspective from me. The African family is most important, is the most important institution as it relates to African health and survival. 
how and this is the question how important is african male and female relationship as it relates to um, uh, african health in general and survival yeah um and again when i when i name african family i'm speaking